So we do have lab this afternoon. This is that magical Monday where we meet for about 50 minutes before lunch. We break for lunch and then we come back at 1.55, right before 2 o'clock. And then we do a lab. So we are doing a lab today. And specifically today, we are working with um, batteries and wires and resistors inside the lab. And the same um, voltmeter that I used on Friday, that little yellow handheld device that measured things like resistance and voltage, we'll be using that um, this afternoon. And quite honestly, for like the next four weeks, we'll be using those, those tools to build and assemble different systems out of different components. Um, just playing with batteries and wires and resistors is fantastic and awesome. You can do a lot of cool things with just those three components, but we'll be gathering and working with additional components um, and make more complex and sophisticated systems. So what I want to do today, we, we talked briefly about these color codes on Friday. And again, electronics is not all that. It's not about being able to read the color codes. It's just like saying, oh, you drive a car? Do you know how to read stop signs? Yes, I do. It's part of driving a car. And once you recognize what a stop sign is, what it means, you just keep on going. So it often takes a while, um, not, not for us, because we're college age, but if you had learned about this way as a little wee one, may, maybe learning the resistor code and reciting the orders and memorizing stuff, that'd be a big deal. For us, it's just a little code so that we can put the value of the resistor on the resistor itself in case it falls down and loses its label, we can look at this series of bands to get an idea of what it looks like. And if you don't have these bands, which often they do because it's just convenient, you can always take out your, your multimeter and measure the resistance for real and get a real value, so that's not a problem as well. But today, I want to take a look at um, actually designing a system based on that battery, that wire, and that resistor. So we're going to, if you have that sheet, we're going to flip it to the front. We're going to take a look at some of these useful things that allow us to design things as a system. So one of the things we're going to talk about is what patterns and what shortcuts and what code we use on the board to represent those actual devices. What, what does a real battery look like? We know what a real battery looks like. That's a real battery, obviously. We had the 9-volt battery. That's a real battery. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of you know extra work if to put a real picture of a battery on the board. Thankfully, double A's are pretty easy to draw. That's pretty obviously a double A, I believe, even though it's pretty large. Um, but we need a system that allows us to say, hey, this is our shorthand for these components. And then what it actually looks like in reality, we can sort of take a, a, a step back from. We don't take time to worry about it yet. So here's this battery, and it turns out that the dimple or the little tiny protrusion up front, that's usually the positive side of the battery. And then there's the negative side of the battery as well. And it's labeled that way. And we saw underneath the, um, the display over there, the 9-volt battery has two posts along the top. Uh, one of those is positive, and then right next door is the negative, but it's still it's sort of like a, or a U or it's bent inside of it. And what we want to do is we want to have the electrons flow, and then when the electrons flow, we have a system. We have this input and we have this output. So as scientists, we know that electrons are negative. And when you have a whole bunch of electrons, I keep on using the term high pressure electrons, that makes that side of the battery negative. And the other side of the battery, they call them poles or posts. The other pole of the um, battery, the positive pole, it doesn't have as much negative electrons and that makes it net positive. And we know, because we're scientists, that net negative electrons are attracted to net positive areas. And this is just me drawing a cartoon on the board. This is not how this battery is constructed. But we can sort of think in our mind that the electrons are kept away from this other area where there's low electrons, making this negative, this positive. 
I mentioned before, if we break this barrier, then the battery short circuits and it literally explodes, usually because it just pulls back. Our goal is to have these electrons leave the battery. We're then going to use them for our own evil designs, and then we'll put them back on the low side. This is very similar to using the high pressure air I had in the air hog. It's very similar to a steam engine where we use coal or wood to boil water and make high pressure steam. We then run the steam through a system. It's also very similar to just um, sending high pressure water through a system like a, hy like a hydraulic system or a dam that the water runs over the dam and goes over a paddle wheel. So things that move, we can use that energy to do something specific. So our goal is to take these electrons out of the negative and then attach them to the positive. Again, that's a picture of a battery, and this is my picture of a wire. So once we draw hieroglyphics of a wire system, we literally just use you know, whatever color marker you want. That happens to be a black marker. We know that these wires in reality usually have some colorful plastic on the outside. You can tell which wire is which. This is a we would call it a red wire. Obviously, the wire itself is sort of this silvery metal stuff. It happens to have red plastic around it. We still call it a red wire. That's a fantastic system, and it'll work. And the electrons will flow, and they'll flow for about a minute, and then the battery will be done. Because the resistance inside this long piece of wire is extremely low. I think we measured that red piece of wire and we saw that this guy was equal to about 0.1 ohms. It was really, really low. And in fact, sometimes it read 0 ohms. And we know when the resistance is low, the current is high. We use this equation. The push is equal to the amount of current times the resistance, V equals IR. That's something that we did inside lab. Um, we were talking about the balloons and the straws, and of course it's this guy right there on our sheet, V equals IR is known as Ohm's Law because of Friedrich Ohm was the first scientist to figure this out. Um, our units of V, I, and R, again, V is voltage, uh, the unit we usually shorten it and call it volts, it's push. The current is, the unit is amperes or even abbreviated to amps, uh, means flow, how much flow. And resistance is Ohm's, named after Friedrich's last name, Friedrich Ohm, V equals IR. So we know if this guy happens to be a 1.5 volt battery, because that's what's stamped on it, and that happens to be the push, if the resistance is amazingly low, then the current is amazingly high. So let's say the resistance really is 0.1 ohms, and here's the voltage of 1.5 volts. Let's find out how much that current is. So current equals, let's see here, V over R. All I'm doing is a little bit of algebra. Divide both sides by R. Our current equals 1.5 volts over 0 0.1 ohms. And I believe, without grabbing my calculator, hmm. let's see if I divide by one. Is that, a, is that 15 amps? That's true. I do that right? I'm, I'm not being a jerk. I'm serious. I'm serious. I can't spell and I can't do simple math either. Let's so make sure I'm that one. That's 15 amps, okay? Is 15 amps a big number or a small number when it comes to amps compared to human experience? Small. Okay. It is small on the grand scheme of things. I would not want to grab a wire that's carrying 15 amps. That's going to be, yeah, that's, gonna, that's pretty high for humans. Um, any more than about a milliamp and things start to get nasty. The tongue thing, um, not bad. There's actually a, a region inside, um, there's a region inside milliamps, I think, that start messing with your heart. But we'll, we'll be working with milliamps um, in lab and you should, so maybe milliamps is too small. I'm thinking maybe an amp though is probably, that's, that's been your experience. Milliamps is really it's really tiny. Yeah, it's a thousand times smaller. I'm just a wimp. I don't want to touch any of this. Well, I mean, that's, still, that's still high, though. So somewhere in between that. That's still pretty high. That's 15 amps. That's pretty high. Um, 15 amps. Don't do this. 15 amps is what you get when you take a wire. Don't do this. 
well, and you don't do this, and you find an outlet, don't do this, <laughs> and you take it and you jam it in the outlet, don't do this. Okay? These guys are, are circuit breakers for 15 amps. So they will supply 15 amps until you short circuit it, and then it tries to do more, and the circuit breakers shut them off. So you, this, is, this, is a, this, is a, this is a commercial building. Actually, this is circuited for 20 amps, uh, but normally a household, um, uh, a normal house is 15 amps. 15 amps is what you do when you accidentally shock yourself plugging things in. It's, it's a pretty big shock. Okay. So anyway, that's regardless of how big that amps is, we'll be talking about different size amps. Because this current is so high, just like our balloon, if I blow up this balloon and then allow a lot of air to race out really quick, the balloon comes back down. Sort of like we did before when we didn't have much of resistance, it just, it just empties. Same thing here. If we just connect the negative and the positive of a battery with a very low resistance wire, it's not going to be a battery for very long. I don't mean it's going to explode. It's, it's, it's going to be empty. It's going to, it's going to drain the battery. So typically what we do is we put a much higher resistance inside this this region here. So we're going to do that. Um, instead of drawing this 15 or this 1.5 volt battery like a real battery, there's a shorthand for a battery. We're going to take the top, sort of the top of the battery, <coughs> like this. We're going to call that positive. And we're going to take the bottom, but because it's a system, um, we're going to call that negative. We're going to make the bottom line of the battery shorter. The thought being that since we're designing the system, the short line will sort of look like a negative sign. That's just, the, it's not supposed to be, but that's the thought. So positive will be the long line and negative will be the short line. And that's going to be our shortcut for talking about a battery. Okay. So here comes our battery up and over, as I saw before. Here comes the line down here, up and over before. But now I want to put a higher resistance than just a wire. I want to slow down the flow. I want to slow down the amps so that my battery doesn't just go and deflate. I want it to be a little bit longer. I want to put this battery inside my Wii controller, and then I want to use it, depending on how much Wii bowling I do. Maybe I want to do it, use it for two months, three months, until it finally goes bad. I don't want it to be gone in a couple minutes. That's too fast. So I want to increase the resistance. So we saw inside the lab, one way to increase the resistance of the air through the straw is to take the straws and to bend them. Okay? So we can make it really bendy or not so bendy. And as I mentioned in the lab, this is the international um, hieroglyphic, the international shortcut for a resistor. It's literally a bent wire or a bent straw. They're not trying to be too crazy that way. So if I go ahead and do this, it doesn't matter how many zigzags I have, that's the international symbol for a, a resistor. So we're going to physically place a resistor inside our circuit. Here's the positive. Here's the negative. And this is a wire. It's just a line. And this is a wire. It's just a line. Remember, it was 0 0.1 ohms the entire length before. So maybe this is 0 0.05 ohms now. And maybe this is 0 0.05 ohms now. We know for a fact, because we're scientists, that those wires have some resistance, but for our, to make our life easy, we're going to say that's around zero ohms. I know it's not zero ohms, we're going to say it, we're not going to worry about it. If we're doing amazingly precise work in an amazingly important physics experiment, and we need to know the exact resistance of the short piece of wire, we'll measure it. But typically, for our purposes, we're going to assume that the resistance of this wire is so close to zero that we're going to, we're going to consider it negligible. We're not going to declare it zero. We're going to say, let's not worry about that. Because we're going to compare that to this guy. Okay. So I had this, I had this resistor before. Remember the size? One of the things we learn in college and in life is size doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter that this guy is so small compared to this wire. The resistance of this guy, we did this on Friday, it was a red, black, red. Anybody remember our red, black, red? Stripe, stripe, stripe. Red, 2,000. Black, 2,000, exactly right. 2,000. Okay, it was a 2 followed by a 0 followed by a 10 to the 2, which is 20. 
the times 100, which is 2,000 ohms. Okay? So if I were to put this resistor in this circuit, that's 2,000 ohms. So again, comparatively, if we're talking about 2,000 ohms, 0 0.05 ohms, not much. Not much of a word. Okay? So reality, even though we're ignoring it, it's not much of a problem. So let's not add 0 0.05. Let's look at the V equals IR. V equals IR. And let's find the, um, the current this time. The current equals V over R. And the voltage is still 1.5 volts according to that battery. Oh, I don't have my picture, my double A, so I have, I have to say V equals 1.5 volts. I have to tell you what that is because it no longer looks like a 1.5 volt battery, it's just like, like two lines. And now I can put 2,000 ohms over here. And I wish I was smart, but I am not. Did anybody do that in their head? I grabbed my mic over there. There we go. Calculator 1.5 divided by 2,000 is. 0 0.00075, 0 0.00075 amps. That's the current, okay? A little bit smaller than this guy, right? I think it's 2,000 times smaller. So if this guy drained in one minute, this guy will drain in 2,000 minutes. I think there's 3,600 minutes per hour. So 20 minutes or so, okay? Maybe half an hour, 200, yeah, something like that. Maybe, maybe 40 minutes. Much, much smaller, we've slowed it down. We're still not there to my, my Wii controller working for months at a time. Maybe the resistance is even higher. But that's really kind of small. Um, amps is a fantastic unit, gosh, I hate to write zeros, zero points, because it confuses me. Um, it's a heck of a lot easier to write this as, uh, did I do this right? Did I do it? Is it too small? No, that's right. Is it right? Is it really that small? Yeah. Holy hell. Um, remember last semester we used um, <coughs> metric prefixes? So if I were to use milli or micro or nano, what would this guy be? What, what number do you want to use? Let's see, one, two, three would be Milli, right? One, two, three would be micro. I think this is 750 microamps. That's pretty small. Remember, micro just happens to be 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6. I could also say it's 0 0.75 milliamps, so less than a milliamp. That's, that's not, that's not um, super secret um, electronics. That's just using the metric prefixes properly. Sometimes it's easier to say 0.75 milliamps than it is to say 0 0.00075 because they're so small. Um, in the lab this afternoon, we're going to be using large thousands or so ohms resistors, so our current will be down in the million microamps. Again, so it's not huge, so that we don't um, lose the push on our battery, and also we don't melt things. There's one more thing that we have to sort of put under our belts when we're talking about this, is we know that this negative plate of the battery contains all of the electrons. So as the electrons come out of the battery, physics-wise, we pretty much assume that the electrons flow that way. They flow away from the negative, because negatives repel, they go this direction, they go up through the <coughs> resistor, and then back into the positive side. Okay? As a physicist, because we're all physicists, because we all had physics last semester, I don't see a problem with that. I have no problem with electrons flowing up. They're negative, right? Electrons flow up, they flow up towards positive. However, in our world, in, the world. in our world, <laughs> things fall down. Lots of things fall down this damn thing called gravity, okay? So for somebody who's just coming to electronics who may not be an astute as a physicist as we all are, that might be confusing, that negative electrons fall up. Because they, we don't want people to 
to work on a big project and go, oh shit, they can fall up and, and switch it. Okay? So the electronics people, not me, this is way before I was born, I mean before we invented dirt. Can we, do you guys mind if we have things fall down in electronics? I'm asking you, I'm saying what the physicist said. And the engineer one of the physicists and said, you guys are physicists, we understand, and we're engineers, we hate each other, but just can you give us this? Can we just have current fall down from positive to negative? Because it's confusing the crap out of us that things fall up. And the physicist said, sure, we're, we're good folks. Why not? Let's have current flow from positive to negative. And that will be our agreement. Okay? So in all the textbooks in all the world, this is the direction of current. Current inside electronics, and hopefully this is not too confusing because we have no problem because we understand negative electrons. Current flows from positive to negative. It flows down. Only because it was too confusing to people who were thinking about it that electrons flowed up. Okay, sure, why not? So when we use this I for current, we're talking about positive current. And then you think, wait, wait a minute, positive current. The protons aren't flowing, the electrons are flowing. However, in electronics, the agreement is, let's pretend as if there was little positive marbles falling up, rather than negatives going the opposite direction. It's complete fiction, but then again, it's a picture, so everything's fiction, right? It's, a picture, it's just a picture. I don't want you guys to see something, not necessarily our textbook for the class, or our book for the deck, or something on the web where they say, hey, here's the current flowing from positive to negative, this is what we use when we're talking about I for current. Capital I is considered positive current. It also allows us to talk about electrons. So when we're specifically asking about which direction the electrons are flowing, then we can go back to that they're flowing opposite, as if the electrons were falling up. Apparently that wigs people out. So here's our positive current flowing away from the positive and then down to the negative. This keeps the engineers happy, or the engineers I can make fun of. Um, here's our plot. Down here is zero on the y-axis. Here's plus 1.5 on the y-axis. And just like if my marker was falling, the charge falls from the top down to zero. That's, that's the thought. They wanted to keep that. Wait a minute, I've learned all through my life and my experience that things fall down. They don't fall up. Um, it's just to keep. I think it causes more confusion to people who already get it. But hey, I won't be testing you on it. It's just that when we see it, when I start slipping into the current goes this way, um, I will try to be and do it. I won't try not to make a mistake. I'll be talking about the current flowing positive and negative, and I'll be talking about the electrons flowing negative to positive. Maybe I, I wish we could rewrite the world, but that's that's where it is. Okay, fantastic. So it doesn't really affect our calculation. The calculation of this value is still here. We don't have a negative in front of it. Remember before, our voltage could be positive or negative, depending on that. Um, and again, that's why when we put the red wire on the positive of the battery, and we put the black wire on the negative of the battery, that's considered positive 1.5 volts, and we switch to considered negative 1.5 volts. So that's our guide. All right, so our next big thing. We're going to just building a circuit out of a battery or a voltage source, it doesn't necessarily have to be a battery, we could plug it in. And a couple wires and one resistor, not very exciting, it doesn't do much. What we want to do is we want to start adding more complex resistors and more complex little circuits to get to do something interesting and useful. So let's add additional resistors. Let's take a system here and let's add a second resistor. Here's the original 2000 ohm resistor. Let's add another 1000 ohm resistor to it. This is our 1.5 volts. And there we go. Let's switch over. If we were to trace where the positive current is flowing, so I can start doing this. Here's I. I flows out of the positive, through here, through the 2,000, through the 1,000, and then back down to the negative. That's my picture of the 
flow. Okay? It turns out that this type of circuit, where the current flows out of the battery, flows through one resistor, and then flows through another resistor, it has a specific word. Why do we call it the World Series for all you baseball fans? There are many. There are more than one. But specifically, how are the more than one arranged? I love your answer. How are they arranged? In order, one at a time. You have to play game, and it's like, well, duh, you can't play game five without playing game one. Um, the reason why it's called a World Series is you start with game one. And only after game one is finished can you even think about going to game two. We don't start game two in the middle of game one. That's different than basketball, okay? We're coming in the March Madness here pretty soon. We have, what are all the names? We have the 64, and then we have the 32, and then Sweet 16. the Sweet, we finally get to the Sweet 16, and then we have the, what is it? Yeah. The Elite Eight, and then there's something about four. Is there a four? Final four. The Final Four, <laughs> and then the big game, right? The reason why it's called the Sweet 16 is because I believe there's 16 teams playing eight games at the same time, or over the same weekend, okay? So they're, they're, those games are happening at the same time, or they can happen at the same time. Usually they don't for TV and broadcast and promotional and commercial system, but they all happen on the same weekend. It's not the same team playing each other, but they play sort of at, the, at different times. So we could do it this way. We could take this wire and do this, and then this wire. comes the current again. This time around, the current splits. Some current goes this way, some current goes that way, and then it meets up at the bottom again. This is still our 2,000 ohm resistor, and this is our new 1,000 ohm resistor. Okay. This configuration is in series, like a baseball series, one after the other. This configuration, it'd be great if we called them the bracket version, because you play in brackets, right? These two play, these two play, these two. This has a special name. Anybody already know this answer? Oh, no, it's parallel. Parallel. And then when you, you find out what it is, it's hard to. You understand. That's exactly right. Did I spell parallel right? Series circuit. Series circuit means that multiple resistors appear one after the other. Parallel circuit, bless you, means that multiple resistors happen at the same time by splitting the current. Okay? Why in the world would we call them parallel? Because these are parallel lines and they look like they're next to each other. Okay? Series, parallel. The total resistance of this circuit, again, ignoring these very small wires, we had R total equaled that guy, 2,000 ohms. Okay. What happened to the resistance in our air circuit as we started adding straws? What happened to the resistance? It increased. Any guess as to how we're going to increase the resistance as we start adding electron or uh, um, resistors? Resistance goes up. Um, two thousand ohms plus one thousand ohms. Thankfully, it's that simple. You just add them again. Okay. In don't worry about straws and time and flow. In electronics, if you take resistors and you add them one after the other in series, their total resistance for the entire circuit just adds up. Okay? So if I take a 2,000 ohm resistor and add right behind it a 1,000 ohm resistor, my total resistance, wait for it, is 3,000 ohms. Okay? You just add them up. Fantastic question. The answer, the answer is no. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could switch it. We could make this a 1,000 and we could make this a 2,000. All that it cares is that you add them up. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. 
and we'll be talking about all kinds of um, analogies in real life. You know, I have to go to the bank and have to pick up the laundry, the laundromat. Okay, when I go to the bank, they're really efficient, and I'll be done up maybe ten minutes at the bank. The laundry folks, there's usually a line, and they're they're not very nice. I don't know why I go there. It takes a half an hour. It doesn't matter if you go to the bank first and the laundry next, or the laundry first and the bank next. As long as they keep their times, it's going to be the same. That's the analogy that we're going to use. We're going to use that analogy in business. They just add up. To keep the math people happy, we just kept the, the engineers happy. Um, to keep the math people happy, we have an equation for that. Okay, there's a picture of a, of, a, of a series circuit with three resistors in the series. The R total is just resistor 1 plus the value of resistor 2 plus the value of resistor 3 plus the value of how many resistors you have. And the way that you would summarize that as a formula is that R total simply means sum up all of the individual resistors. And in, I'm not Greek today because I can't have Greek letters. There you go. Capital sigma for sum. Just sum them up. Add up all the R. I know you guys can use your eyes and you can tell, you can physically tell there's a different thing going on between the series arrangement and the parallel arrangement. So some of you already know electronics, so I'll ask everybody, including people with their gut reaction. When we put two resistors side by side in parallel, what does your gut tell you for the total resistance of the flow? Does the total resistance go up and slow things down by adding an extra resistor next to it? Or does the total resistance go down and the flow goes up by adding another resistance next to it? So the question visually is this. I can take a straw and have the air go through there and then add one after it. We know that slows it down. Or I can take a second straw and put it there and effectively make this straw twice as wide. What would that do to the flow if I made this straw twice as wide? Make the flow higher, which makes the resistance go down. Okay. If you're at Walmart and you're going through the checkout line that has a relatively efficient checkout person, and then they open up another register with someone who's really good at their job, what happens to the total flow of the customers? They go out faster. The, the total flow goes up, we're all saying the same thing, and the resistance goes down. Okay. Let's op, let me ask you the other direction. Let's say you have a, um, a pretty efficient cashier at Walmart, and then they open another register, but this person's not very good. But what happens to the total flow? Even though they're not as good as this one, even though the resistance is twice as high as this one, the overall flow is still lower. Okay, they're still. It's as if straw-wise, it's as if we're increasing the area. We already saw in the lab that if we decrease the area, the resistance goes way high and the flow goes down. So if we make it smaller or longer, that makes the resistance go up. If we make it shorter or wider, that makes the resistance go down. Okay, so. Given these two options, and we'll be talking about designing circuits later, if you need to, and there's a reason why you need to sometimes, if you need to slow down the flow, you're going to add resistance in series. And if you need to speed up the flow, then you add resistance in parallel. So we need an equation to calculate what this means. What's the value? Okay, The total value over here of 1,000 ohms plus 2,000 ohms literally is 3,000 ohms, but if we put them in this parallel circuit, we need a different equation. It turns out that R total, what did you call it again? R equivalent. We call it the, the, the R equivalent, we can call it the equivalent circuit, or we call it the R total parallel, whatever you want to do. If you look at this entire collection as a box, let me pause again real quick. This is just some sort of a resistor. We're not really sure what it is. Holy crap, it's a circuit. 
Okay, I'm sorry. It's a it's a it's a system. We don't. It's a circuit. It's also a system. Is what I'm, the point is? What I'm going for. We may not know exactly what's going on inside of it, but it has an input and it has an output and it does something. Okay. So we need an equation that describes what this system of two resistors in parallel is working on. It's actually pretty simple. What we do is we take the one over the first resistor, and we take one over the second resistor, and then when we're done, we have one over the result. Okay? They add in inverse. So we numerically calculate one over the resistance of the first one, plus one over the resistance of the second one. Unfortunately, when we're done, we get units of one over ohms, so we have to bring the whole thing back up by taking the inverse. So let's do that. 1 over, I'm going to call this R1. I'm sorry, I just put a 2 there as I said R1 because I'm insane. R1, and this guy is R2. R1 is 2,000, plus R2 is 1,000. And then when we're done, let's do that. I did that right? Did I make a mistake? Um, question. So, Simon, there is a pairing going in. That means yeah. that system is open or closed? It's open. So, yeah. so how does it work? Uh, switch. Yeah. Yeah. Cut, cut the wire or close or open the switch. You know, it's the same thing. So I'm literally going to take um, 2,000 and press the 1 over button, which on my calculator is 1 over. I'm going to add 1,000 and press the 1 over button. And that equals, it turns out that this number is really, really small. You don't need to do this, but that equals. 0 0.0015 and negative 1. And then I need to 1, one over my answer. So I'm going to shift 1 over the answer. And for all of you who are ready to go into Lent, I apologize. 6.6 6. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bad comment? I apologize. Fantastic. Good up, done. Resistance is 666.666 repeating ohms. Okay. Is it zero? No. However, it's smaller than any one of these guys. Okay. This guy was 2 plus 1 equals 3. This guy was 1 over 2 plus 1 over 1 is 1 over, well, you have to go ahead and do the calculations and get a common denominator. It's actually, like, well, it's 2 thirds. I'm going to bring it back, 666.66. We could spend all kinds of numerology stuff and go, hey, wait a minute. This is 1 third smaller than the smallest resistor. 1 third smaller than 1,000 is 666. So it's really, it's one third smaller than the smallest resistor, which is just the inverse of, oh my gosh, my brain's going to show up. Um, the, there's a pattern there, and the old folks who are older than me, the folks who do this for a living, they don't need to use calculators. They're just like, oh, it's one fifth done. Because the pattern holds. It's not random. It's not a random number generator. But we don't have to worry about guessing the answer. We can just calculate it. So we need an equation. And that's this equation right here. The R total for a parallel circuit, or you can call it the equivalent circuit, is simply take up, here we go, take all of the resistors and add them up one over, and then when you're done, flip it back over, take the inverse of that guy. So that's this guy on here. Sum up all the one all the one over the one overs. And then when you're done, take that total and then flip it again, bring it back up. That's just practically how we do that. So when we get in the equation, we figure that out. Okay. We're going to be working with resistors this afternoon in lab, about an hour and a half from now. We're going to be putting together a system in series with multiple resistors. We're going to be putting together a system in parallel with multiple resistors, and then we're going to measure their voltages, and we're going to calculate their currents to find out how they go. It's pretty <clears throat> obvious, the way I've drawn it, that the current splits, 
some of it goes this way and some of it goes that way. And we're going to be talking about this in lab this afternoon. This guy is called a current divider. And how does the current know that there is like another alternative to the fantastic question? Because I catch myself thinking about the flow of current as little tiny people. It just happens. How, and this is not me being a jerk. How does my marker know that my arm is not flat and it should roll that way? It just does. Because it's well, it's fall, it's falling down energy wise, it's losing energy. I don't call it gravity because it's like a distance and a flow of the part of it. Right. It's still gravity. So you could explain the exact same thing since since gravity is a field, all we're talking about is electric fields. And we're really talking about electrons flowing this way. Well, the electrons do the job and they actually go ahead and flow this direction, and then some of them flow this way, some of them flow this way, but over time, they experience more resistance here. So just like customers at Walmart, this sort of backs up, so more flow this way. Okay, so based on your theory, regardless whether there is a change right here, yes. that means that the system will be falling here too, right here, regardless. What, what word did you use, resistance? Or the, current. Volt, the current, yeah, the current will go through, yeah. Yeah, but it, even though it's waste, it's going to be wasted. So if, if you remove the resistor and make this a short circuit, right. then we ignore this. It's just, it's just like, so now I really do imagine them as being people. We're getting out of Walmart. You can wait 2,000 minutes to check out, or you can take your stuff for free and get to your car. Right. Which well, way are you going to go? Well, you know the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking my stuff for free. I'm out and buy. I'm gone. Right, right. <laughs> but you can tell that there's a line open here for that. But you, but you have no idea that this uh, line is open right here. So. That is correct. So this is literally the propagation of, of information. You can literally think of little tiny people or customers exactly. going this way. And then only after they experience that that's faster does it open up. Okay. But that's the same the same reasoning as me, we're almost done, as me, why isn't there water flowing out right now because it's closed, but as soon as, and, and, but the water's, the water's trying to get out, but as soon as I open up the valve, it starts to flow because I've decreased the resistance from near infinity to smaller. So this, this is, which way do the water molecules know how to go? It literally is the water molecules sort of communicate with each other. I'm getting really fun at feel, but yeah. We're going to be building these in the lab today to get a more hands on understanding of how these things fly. And ah.